Yeah, there's only about 60 to go. Um, now, after we've calculated our model, the pressing question is, is it any good? And can we use it for something useful? So this is the question of residuals and the question of confidence limits that we're looking at. Now, <clears throat> let's, let's speak briefly about residual. <coughs> What's the residual in the first place? That's a, that's a bit illustrated here. There's the residual in principle is the distance of an observed value, the true data, that's what the data point is, from the point where it should be if the ideal model were 100% correct. And there's some assumptions that need to go into residuals, into the distribution of residuals, the, the epsilon terms. Um, that influence whether a meaningful model can be calculated in the first place. So <clears throat> the error term in principle should have a zero mean because if it doesn't have a zero mean it will basically shift your ideal curve away from where it should be and this will be perfectly and invisibly compensated in your par parameters. So. There's the intercept parameter. If your error terms pulls your, your, your data up, then the intercept will go up, and you will never notice it. You think your data is, is, is not good, but there's no real good way to compensate for that. The error term should also have constant variance, i.e. the variance should be independent of the large and small values. This is a term we violated in our model because it was biologically meaningful to do so. And just note that in this case, it, it wasn't a very dramatic violation. Um, the parameters were recaptured in any way. If the violation would have been large, essentially this would mean that we're weighting the deviations on the far end of our distribution more strongly than the deviations at the close end of our spectrum. Right, so there's just more variability there. So the curve is going to be, or the regression line, is going to be more influenced by the distribution of points at the far end than at the near end of the spectrum. And in order to make conclusions for prediction, the error terms should be normally distributed because only if we know what kind of error to expect, we could then say, what's our expectation whether um, a new point is going to be close or far away from the line that we've just calculated. So <clears throat> here's some examples of, of things that, that are not linear. So this is, this is um, not equal variance. So this is the ideal thing. The error terms should have a mean of 0, and it should be uh, more distributed. Uh, this is the situation approximately that, that we modeled with a smaller variance at one end and a large variance at another end. Still, it has zero mean. You're going to get good parameters. Um, the predictions are not going to be as good out here because the, the variance simply is going to be larger. But overall, since the prediction goes over average error terms, we might not notice this. We might over, be overconfident of our model's predictive properties in this area. This is this is poor. This is what you're actually looking for in a 
plot or you plot um, <coughs> your independent parameter versus your variance. Because this says there's another model, some kind of a model, some kind of a relationship, some kind of a correlation that's not even captured by our linear model. Our linear model cannot explain everything systematic that's going on in the data. And this tells us the model itself is poor. Never mind the fit and the coefficient of correlation and all, all the other numbers. Just qualitatively, we see there's some reality, some physical, biological reality that we're missing because there is still some relationship in the data that's in the residuals, i.e. after we've subtracted our best possible model. So that means that there must be another uh, non-linear model that would be explaining better the, your data, is that what it means? Exactly, that's what I would try. I would try to have a superposition, well, either it could be um, um, a quadratic relationship or an exponential relationship mm -hmm. or something to begin with, or try a superposition of a model that you with a linear model and simply an addition and so on. I need to rethink. Somehow my observations are violating the key, the fundamental assumptions in the model and that, that there is a linear relationship. Okay. Now, <clears throat> this, is a, this is an interesting plot. So this is simply a plot of the residuals Line and it shows you the magnitude. Um, it's kind of nice to look at. It, it may not be as meaningful. It's, it's a pretty plot. But if you're trying to, to illustrate the residuals, this, this is a very easy plot. I've put this here because it shows us some interesting <coughs> R syntax that I'd actually like you to go through. So we'll take a little break from just you know listening and phasing out and uh, reproducing this here on your R consoles. So if we go back to the V key, statistics model 5, um, nope, module 6. Regression. So this is our data function, and you you know you don't actually need to source it and, and store it. That's the normal way I would do it to be saving uh, variations. You can just paste it in here. So let's do that. Okay, paste, return. Now the function make data is defined. In fact, if we invoke the function without parameters, it's not being executed. But R gives us the definition of the function. That actually um, is what R does for all functions. So uh, if I press LM and don't give it, or if a key in LM and don't give it parameters, you know, I get this complete source code of everything that's behind generating and reading and applying these uh, linear models, which is you know not so much if you think of it, just you know, 100 lines of code or so. Anyway, so make data is then defined. The next step we had is to use it to make 40 data points. And we can then list these 40 data points. <clears throat> they are our random heights and weights, column one. This guy is, uh, or girl, is two meter and two tall, weighs 78 kilos. That's a bit skinny. Two meters and 78 kilos. Yes, and each of these has different values. And each of you are going to have different values because we didn't use the set seed function this time. Oh yeah, yeah. You could use the set seed function here. Um, maybe just put the set seed function into the function itself. Um, and 
what we then did was just plot it, plot this data matrix, label height in centimeters. Oh, that's actually wrong, in meters. Um, on the x-axis, weight in kilograms on the y-axis. And I see nothing because I don't see my quartz window here. There it is. Okay. That's what that looks like. Because you have defined the two by two table for the presentation. I think you have to put it in the way. Okay, everybody got that? The next step is to evaluate this with a linear model. Linear regression analysis. This is the call, <coughs> intercept and data. The fit is not as good as we had it the last time. But remember, when we looked at the summary, we saw that there is some variability in there. And the regression line, you know, I think I need to redo the plot. And we plot the regression line without actually entering the parameters. Just A, B line is linear model. Oh, and I forgot something here, which you've, I'm sure you've noticed before. There's now one character missing, and it asks me to complement this with the missing character, closing this square bracket. There we go. Okay, and now this is this is the regression line that that we get here in this case. Different random variables, different distribution, uh, different solution to the best description of the data. Now, <clears throat> let's calculate the residuals and the idealized values, and we we just put that into vector. The residuals is this function resid of the linear model of these the, the y x and no, the x column modeling the y column and the idealized values is the fitted data that is produced by that model where the x value goes exactly through the parameters, i.e. all the points that are generated in this fit vector <coughs> lie perfectly lie on that line. And I just put them into two vectors <coughs> with the name RES and FIT. And that's that. Nothing happens because this just all all this is doing is putting something into a vector and I can I can look at that vector um, get the first 10 values of, of the i-axis, the y-axis. Now, <clears throat> if you look 
look at these values here. Now, th these are the idealized fitted values. You notice that they're, they are not sequential. They're all over the place. So this is 80, 80, 77, 67, 77, 86, and so on. And that's because these are the values that correspond to the x values in our data matrix. And these are not ordered. And that's kind of important because if we if we start plotting, say, the residuals like that or the fit like that, and since they're not ordered, they would be you know, jumping left and right and back again as they go over the entire plot. The plot could become very messy. So what we should do is we should be ordering or sorting our data on the x-axis to proceed. And that's slightly intricate to understand how you can achieve that. It's actually beautifully general and simple, but before we start, uh, let me just plot um, this here quickly. This is fit against residuals. <clears throat> Anybody dare to interpret this plot for me? Fit against residuals. What, what is fit? Fit the price. Is what would be expected. The idealist one. The idealist one. And the residuals is the magnitude um, of the actually observed residuals. And as you see, there's a, there's a trend there that you know, sort of gets larger as you go to larger values. Which is simply in the way we've generated the data. Um, if we, Raphael talked about QQ plots. And you see that that looks pretty good, actually. Right? <clears throat> so if they were drawn from a normal distribution, um, they would um, they, they don't violate the assumption in a systematic way that they're normally distributed. So that's good. Now, let's look at the prediction and confidence limits. So in principle, prediction and confidence is easily calculated. Uh, With the predict function and the parameter p or c, you can get different ideas of where a new point lies with respect to the old data. But as I said, you have to, you have to order this first. Otherwise, the li these lines that you get, if you want to plot that, will be connected all over the plot. And I, I need to put in a little intermezzo here uh, to show you how that is done. Just wondering where I put it. Okay, so <clears throat> maybe I'm just going, going to type this in. Bear with me. Now, in order to... S <laughs> the idea is the following. If we sort a vector, it's obvious what we're doing. 
we're, we're arranging the elements in that vector from largest to smallest or from smallest to largest. If we sort a matrix, it's not obvious what we're going to do. Because that depends on what column you're sorting out. So in order to sort a matrix, you have to specify and sort that matrix by defining which column you're sorting out. And the way this is achieved in R is to use a function which is similar to sort, but spits out the order of the sorted elements. And apply that to a matrix row by row. So, We have this vector here of our data, right? So this is our, our um, x-axis, and this is our y-axis. And <clears throat> if we order this, if, if we make a vector which is calculated as the order of the first column. This gives me a column of the indexes in the right order that they are, if I apply these indexes, that they're sorted. So if I make that vector and, oh, this is what I get. This is the smallest column is in column 26, the second smallest is in 22, the third smallest is in 20. Fifth smallest is in 32 and so on. So 26, 24, 32, and so on. You see it rises in 1.51, 1.56, 1 1.59, and so on. So how is this vector useful? That gives me the order. Well, I can I can display um, my matrix cell by cell. So I can display my matrix by saying, you know, just give me the value that is in row 2. So like that. Or I can look at row 26. Or I can look at row 22. And so on. So the point is, since I can address this point by point, if instead of giving it the explicit indexes, I feed it this entire vector, I will get the entire matrix in a sorted fashion. Right? So because these are the indices of the sorter that I generated by ordering the indexes in column one. Doing the same thing for Y, I would have just put in order on column two into this vector, then plug that into here and get the results. So simply typing O in here now gives me the vector sorted on the x values. Right? Trivially, let's just sort it on the y, y values too, so that would be the data vector um, And you get the light guys first, and as you go down, you get the headers. Notice that this is still sort of all over the place on the constraint that there's a relationship between the data 
but um, this is not perfect. Order. Once you understand that, it's really powerful and general and versatile. But you have to understand you have to use this order function to generate a list of indices, a vector of indices. And then you can use the vector of indices to address your data vector row by row by row to then get the data in a different sorting order. Now, so I, I do that here and I store that. You should too in a data vector data two, which is now sorted on the x values. And now, if we plot something um, about residuals or about confidence limits, we nice we nicely go monotonous, monotonously from left to right through the entire plot, and the lines are not all over the place. So I calculate. I calculate um, the prediction values. Oops, that's not in there. And I add the lines from the PC vector and the PP vector to the plot. So again, this is simply the plot. Now let's add these lines here. And These lines here. Okay. <clears throat> so the limits of confidence and the limits of prediction. If you if you want to specify the expectation value for something manipulated. These are the boundaries that describe. The outer boundaries basically describe the predicted value. So if you have an unknown data point that was not in that set, that is drawn from um, the from, from an, the same distribution, but newly, it's going to lie within these boundaries. And this is this is basically telling you how good is my model for predicting something. So it will predict that new values will lie somewhere within these boundaries. And if you think this is pretty broad around the, the, the linear model, yes, uh, it is, because there's a lot of variation in the data. And um, this, this nice fancy plot will tell you exactly where the confidence limits of your model are. And also you can look at individual parts and identify them as, as outliers within within this home or uh, uh, P and the C uh, stands for uh, confidence limits and where's my R window? All the parameters are nicely explained 
in the manual. <laughs> I thought it would be. Um, here, predict linear model. Okay. Anyway, um, in in the in the documentation, what's important to know is that the inner bounds basically explain your data as it is, or refer to the data as it is. The outer bounds uh, refer to predictions of data that you haven't observed yet. So you to, uh, Yes. Something like that. It should coincide with with your uh, with your t-test, and and that the significant outliers should also lie outside of that plot. If you're plotting control against experiment. Okay, because if there's no effect, if they're all the same, they should all be on a line, and then they should start deviating from that. Okay. Okay. Now, just a very brief note, because in the end it's all more of the same on multiple regression. Multiple regression assumes a model like this. Y is a constant intercept plus some scaling factor operating on one set of, of the x coordinates, some scaling factor operating on another set of x coordinates, and another scaling factor third set from x And all of these adding to each other to finally observe, make the one observed result. So um, <coughs> just to note here, um, you set this up with more parameters. You usually, in order to get good results, you need a lot of data points because there's additional um, modeling parameters involved, um, but you can in principle apply similar sum of squared errors techniques to come up with uh, the same uh, kind of minima as in the linear models. So essentially it works in a similar way except that this time you're combining several different effects. This is the kind of modeling you would use, um, for instance, if we have um, caloric intake, height, and weight, and you're trying to, to establish the relationship of caloric intake and height jointly on the weight of the individual, and tease apart the relative contributions on the weight that that makes. Now, sometimes you have a priori knowledge about the functional form from first principles. And you know that it's not a linear model to begin with. Now, in some cases, you can transform your model and simply take all the y values and transform them into in, on a function and get a linear model from that, solve the linear model, transform the parameters back, and know what that would be. But sometimes that transformation isn't, isn't obvious or possible. And you're then in the position or in, in the need to do the so-called nonlinear regression analysis. And um, this is usually 
a situation where minimization close to one, i.e. analytical minimization, is not possible. So for linear regression analysis, we can write down a formula, plug in the observed data points, and come up with the right solution. Nonlinear minimization is almost always um, a numeric procedure where you come up with some start values, you try out how, how well they fit, you calculate the sum of squares estimate, you tweak the parameters, you recalculate the sum of squares estimate, and you accept the new parameters if they've improved your model, and you try different things if you haven't improved the model. So in principle, what you usually do is, you know, you think of a, of a surface um, that reflects the different parameters and you look for a gradient on that surface from a, from a certain point and you try to slide down that gradient until you, you basically end up in a, in a minimum of error for the parameters that you're trying to optimize. The problem is there's no guarantee that this minimum is going to be um, not a local minimum. So in principle, only under some circumstances can you guarantee that you have a global minimum and sometimes when you minimize from starting parameters you can get stuck especially if your functions are complicated if they if your functions have poles somewhere i.e. regions where they go to infinity um, especially difficult if the parameters are not linearly independent i.e. if a change in one parameter uh, needs to be comp or can be compensated by a change in another parameter. So if they're not independent, you can just choose them in whatever way you want, and your your analysis will never convert. But um, <clears throat> there's a certain amount of trial and error that needs to go into that. One part of the trial and error is to go choose good starting parameters. And in order to choose good starting parameters, often it's useful to simulate your model and work with it a little bit and try to establish uh, what your parameters and what the change of your parameters actually do. So here's an example for that. And what I'm doing here is I'm considering a function which is called the logistic function because it's, the logistic function is useful for many other things. And originally the logistic function was formulated as a way to characterize population growth under limited conditions. So this is a population that has n members, say gerbils in a cage, large cage, maybe like a large number, a couple of thousand. And uh, of course, what gerbils do, what gerbils do, is the population grows over time. And this term here characterizes the rate of growth. It says the difference in the number of gerbils between yesterday and today is a certain number, ti and pi plus one, the current time step and next time step. So basically this says the number of gerbils that were added to the, to the population, time step first time step, and a lot. And that's simply the reproductive rate of the gerbils, i.e., you know, I don't know what the gestation time of gerbils is, Maybe you know, six weeks for them to multiply. About two days from when you bring them home. Hmm? About two days from when you bring them home. Two days from when, when you bring them home. Okay, so you can calculate back from that. <laughs> and that's the reproductive rate under ideal um, situations. So the population at time t i would grow in principle under ideal situations by that amount. But there's a limiting situation here because you know at some point you just stop feeding them. <laughs> or cleaning their cage. I don't know that doesn't have to be bothered them. Or you know the cage just gets too small and they, they start getting stressed and eating you know, all these educational things that they do at home. So parents eating the kids, I don't know, is that why they actually give them gerbils? So they see that could also happen. <laughs> Anyway, so there's a limit here. Uh, in population statistics, this is called the carrying capacity. This is as much as the system will allow. And when you have as many in your population as that carrying capacity, this term goes to one. When that term goes to 
when this term goes to zero, when this term goes to zero, there is no more growth. That's when the population is at equilibrium. No more gerbils are added, or equilibrium actually doesn't mean no more gerbils are <coughs> added. It just means they die as quickly as they can reproduce. So this is a this is a discrete expression here. In you can also write it as a continuous expression dn over dt is the differential equation is r and t over this term. And this is a rate. This doesn't tell you anything yet about your population. Um, to solve, to get the population, <laughs> Michelle has a different font set than I do. Um, never mind. This is, this is what counts. Um, <clears throat> this is, in principle, the functional form of the population that arises from that. So, Writing this in R gives you this nice kind of function that is initially the girls, girls grow very, very fast, but then as they approach the carrying capacity, the growth levels off until the uh, growth of the population basically peters out. And you have, have a lot of them, but you're not getting any more. Now, we can use something like that, and it is used something like that. You know, it looks like a classic dose response curve. So it's not, we're not just interested in gerbils in a cage, we're interested in, you know, if somebody's been smoking for all of their life, what's the probability that they get lung cancer at a certain age? Or um, if they have high cholesterol, what's the probability that they'll get a heart attack after a certain number of years? And we have these dose response curves for that. that <coughs> So we can use that for a simulation model. This is a simple simulation model that we apply here. Um, the logistic function for our disease is a function of n. Again, it's, it's basically the same thing as calculating our age and weight distributions. Uh, we empty a vector. And we calculate a random number that's distributed according to this exponential here. Now this is, this is the core, and uh, that is what I need to describe a little bit. Because what I'm going to show you is that this, you can use this as a very general technique um, to allow to generate arbitrary probability. So let's, let's first look at this expression that I've used here to, to generate um, <clears throat> 1 over 1 plus the exponent over some scale number in the range from minus 50 to 50. This is simply the, the, the formulation of the logistic function that we kind of had before. You know? It's uh, the value of the logistic function is 1 over 1 plus e to the minus z, where z is some parameter that could vary over time. Could be age, could be uh, doses of medication. Now, if we want to simulate some random numbers that look like that logistic function, the easiest thing to do is if R has that in its function package. In fact, that's what you do if you use R uniform, random uniform estimates, or R normal, random normal deviates. But if R actually doesn't have, I don't even know if they have a logistic random deviate. Use the code that I showed you to generate such random deviates in a completely general sense. So this is this is the core of that function. If you just plug in a different function here, you can get different random deviates. The idea is that at first you choose a random number in this interval, any random number. Once you have that random number, you calculate a second random number in this interval. Now, if the second random number falls above the line, we accept it. If it's below the line, we reject it. So imagine that we're at this inflection point. At this inflection point, 
we should expect that random deviates generated at this point should have a probability of being acceptable to consent. And that's exactly what we get, because there's 50% probability that will be below the line and 50% probability that will be above. If we're somewhere down here, we should be accepting things with a small probability. We should only get a very small set of random numbers. So if we're only accepting them below the line here, it's only rarely that one will go into our distribution. And if it's above the line, it's um, frequently that we'll reject it and exactly the opposite. So basically, by putting random numbers on this plot here and accepting only instances where they fall beneath that curve, we're doing something like a numerical integration because in the end, the number of curves that we, the uh, number of points that we accept is dependent on the area under the curve. Right? The smaller the area is, the less points we accept. And the larger the area is here, the more points we reject and so on. So, so basically, calculating a random number here and a random number here is equivalent to numerically integrating over this probability density function and we can use this to generate us numbers that are distributed in this way. And that's what we're doing here. So <clears throat> this is a uniform distribution. One sample from 1 to 100, which gives us a real value number. And we cut that off to the floor. So we drop everything uh, behind the decimal point, and we just take the integer part of it. And that gives us an estimate of weight, of age. Um, basically, a point somewhere along that curve, a random number on that x-axis. We then calculate a second value. S is a uniform distribution between one value no parameters specified, therefore by default between 0 and 1. And this is basically where we look on the y-axis, where a random plot, where a random point would fall on the y-axis. And then we say, if s is smaller, then age, taken through this transformation, which will give us this logistic regression function. So basically, evaluating the function term at that point. If s is smaller than that, we append the value to our vector, i.e. we accept the value. And I don't know if I have this wrongly in the notes, but there should be. should work. Because we have to update um, our I. <coughs> um, otherwise, you have an right? This is a while loop. We're testing whether we already have n estimates here. If I never gets increased, um, you, it just runs in. You have to hit the escape key. Um, so this is the update function here. So we add to this vector x element after element after element of um, ages that correspond in the distribution to um, this logistic regression function. And what that does is run this, source it or paste it, um, do this maybe 10,000 times. We don't want to look at the entire vector then because it's 
large. You use the head function on the vector, just the first 20 elements, for example. Or you can also use the tail function, not heads and tails. This is not statistics, even though it's R. Head and tail. Or the tail function for the last 20 elements. And you know, this is what you gave it this distribution of agents, where under this model, our pro brand would have be become ill. LBs, right? Ah, X, L, because that's the end that you get to the function of the LBs. Yes. Whatever the name of the function is, you're right. And, okay. So we have 10,000 agents, and then we're interested in, you know, how many of these do we actually have? Now, we could typically calculate a histogram for that, right? Just put it into hist of that vector, and you'll get a histogram of the distribution. Here I've done something slightly different, and that's tabulate. Tabulate is a function which is sort of similar to histogram, but now every single integer value has its own histogram bin. So since I have 99 ages, 1 to 100, in my, my bin here, I get 99 possible values on my vector, and the 99 values have um, the frequency of observing that particular age, and this is the distribution. So it sort of looks like simulated data of um, a logistic regression or simply treated as a general nonlinear function here in this case of one single risk factor being applied to um, <coughs> a program. And again, the question is, well, this is nice. We have something that sort of speaks to us and relates to problems that we'd like to think about. Can we use are tools to recover the parameters. The parameters here were this in the functional form, h minus 50 basically um, took the function which is normally symmetric around zero and hooked it such that the inflection point here should be at 50 years old. And there's also a scaling factor. Um, normally the, the logistic function goes to zero close to zero, around six, um, minus six and six. So if you scale that um, by 0.1, um, you sort of get this distribution between zero and 100 approximately. So that's the scaling factor we had put into the model. Can we get these scaling factors back by the nonlinear modeling technique? Now, <coughs> nonlinear least squares fitting with R is a generalized version of linear least squares <coughs> fitting, but this is the, the function template that you have to give. So the function is non-linear least squares fit, and you have to supply a formula. This is the formula that you actually fit on. You also have to define some data, and you have to define some starting parameters of the data. To know, you know what's your initial first guess in what the parameters so the formula can, from our example can be written simply in one line. Fz is a function T S T M of B, function of time, function of scale, function of median time, and function of something that, that generates a slope in that. If B is large, you get a very steep response. If B is small, you go sort of get shallow dose response. And this is same formula that I've used before with a different name parameter. That's the same formula that, that simulated my data to begin with, plus the, the random noise that we applied. And after this is defined, we can try some reasonable starting parameters. And we can say, please draw me a curve of the formula Fz, and this is generally useful if you want to overlay and plot um, curves over data. You can use curve of this formula specified in some way of um, 
<coughs> some uh, the, the data on x with a parameter for s, a parameter for t, and, and a parameter for b. So as possible starting parameters. And we know that, that um, the values here are 50 and, and 1 to that is fine. But this is the curve we get. You know, that's sort of similar to our data. It's, of course, not perfect and not identical. And <coughs> as long as it approximately models the data, it's, it's going to be good. If any of these parameters have the wrong sign for it, in order to get the right parameters, they have to go through zero and then invert. This is really bad for any kind of numerical optimization. This is something that's very hard. Or if there are many orders of magnitude wrong, then they sometimes also. Um, it's actually interesting to see from, from which wide range of parameters this comes from. So this is approximate, right? And <laughs> so we, we save our counts per age as, as the tabulation of our x vector. So basically, this is the, the y values. Um, we generate uh, simply a list of 1 to 99 values as the x values. And then we invoke NLS as that count is modeled by the function f set with the parameters h, s, uh, median, and b. The starting parameters for s are 180, median 8, b is And this is then added, um, basically generating the structure res.fit, um, which has the parameters um, of the nonlinear regression that we can use here at the time. Okay. And we run this. And after it converges, which it does, up to seven iterations uh, to a very low tolerance, um, we find that the 200 is well reproduced. 50 is well reproduced, and the 0.1 that we had in our original model is also well reproduced. And then we can take this curve function again, plug in the parameters that our model gave back, and replot that onto our graph to see how well this now explains. So this was a, the red line was our first guess at what the parameters could be. The blue line here is the nonlinear least square split on a function of that form from which we've drawn uh, these functional points to begin. So <clears throat> if you ever had to fit like uh, protein folding stability curves or Michael's maintenance kin kinetics and so on in some different package, um, I find doing this in R exceedingly simple, straightforward, and robust. And it gives very good results. So it's this, this very flexible way to, to find things to specify the formula and then just adding in the parameters that you need. Um, that's that's very gentle. Hmm? To make this work, I have to have some idea of what shape my data is going to have, right? Time. To make this work, you have to have some idea of the functional form of the formula, of the model that's beneath your data. I could do a linear least square split if I thought that that would be the functional model. Actually, that would be a nice, simple exercise. If you, if you wonder about the syntax here, simply write an, uh, y equals a x plus b and substitute that into, this, in, into the formula that we've had here and see how that can be fit. In. Of course, you don't need to use uh, the linear model procedure of R, but you can use the nonlinear least squares fit with a linear function, and that should give you the same result. But you need some idea of what uh, Francis, you should stop. <laughs> yeah. are, are you in 
sure it if I trip over that break like this. Um, so you, you need basically to have some idea what your functions form. I'm not aware of programs that I'm not saying they don't exist. I'm not aware Um, it's exceedingly hard to come up with a program that will derive functional forms from raw data. Um, it's not impossible. I think six or eight weeks ago, there was a Nature paper where researchers had built a computational inference machine that could take physical data and deduce the functional form of the underlying guiding principles from that, based on nothing but the data itself. And what they applied it to was a chaotic system, basically um, a coupled pendulum. If you have a coupled pendulum where a pendulum swings and the pendulum is attached to that, it will undergo chaotic motion. And they fed their system a time series from that. And the system actually was able to come up with the correct functional description of the data, even though there was noise there, plus had on the fly deriving Newton's uh, laws of motion from that as conservation of mass and, and energy uh, within these forms. So I'm not aware that this is available for every day and everybody's use. It would be beautiful if you could just take your data and throw it into a black box, and the black box tells you what it is. So that's not in general use right now, so you're not all out of the job right away. So the black box is some biological insight and thinking is still required. So yes. For practical purposes, you have to know or guess the functional form. You have to have some idea what possible functional forms exist, how to write them as mathematical expressions, um, and choose the one that fits your data with the least number of possible parameters. several and see which one would you, would you pick would be the one that has higher or lower one the R, the correlation coefficient? Yes. Yes. But, you know, as, as with the clustering, it's a trade-off between being able to fit something well with the coefficient of correlation and adding a large number of, of parameters. The large number of parameters um, will increase your confidence limits. So the smaller the number of parameters are, the, the smaller your confidence limits are going to be. Okay, now this, this really had nothing much to do with logistic regression because I just used a logistic function as an example of a curve that can be fit with uh, a nonlinear least squares fit. But the logistic regression is, I don't know why some of these work sometimes, that's weird. Um, <clears throat> in order to summarize the data in terms of you know, confidence and prediction, there's much the same extraction functions as the data model in the documentation says. Now, risk effect data in scenarios that have a binomial outcome, something like dead or alive, or infected and healthy, or cancer, cancer-free can be modeled by linear combinations of these logistic functions. Yes? Do you know that? Is that the starting parameters? Yeah. Educated guess. So in, in this case, I determine um, that si since I know approximately what a plain logistic function would look like, i.e. it goes between 0 and 1, and um, it goes to zero, or it comes close to zero at minus six, and it comes close to one at, um, at plus six. You sort of try to scale it in between that, and it's just the linear scaling. It. You try to use some reasonable parameter of beta. So it's, an, it's basically an educated guess, and then I, I, I draw out my educated guess on the data with curve function and see 
whether you know it, it somehow vaguely resembles my data or whether it you know, shoots off into, into space. And when it vaguely resembles my data, um, I'm, I can be pretty confident that it will converge on the correct solution. So the choice is basically an educated guess about your, your knowledge of the mathematics of, of the function that you're fitting here. <clears throat> Okay, now if we have possible outcomes, dead and alive, infected and healthy, cancer, cancer free, and so on, uh, we, we can apply something that we can that is called logistic expression. And if we assume a set of risk factors that each contribute to this logistic function, so basically the functional form is not just e to the minus z but with one parameter. But there's a beta 1 x1 and a beta 2 x2 and a beta 3 x3 and so on that all contribute to that. Um, we can look at data and try to model what these individual risk factors are and identify the quantity. So basically what we do here is a, isn't that weird? So sometimes I get these hashes and if I just go forward and backward with the slides, I get different hashes. Weird, huh? Predictable nature of computers. Okay, so this is this is the formula, and we can rearrange that. Maybe I can reproduce this. Okay, nice. <laughs> and we can rearrange that by multiplying by this term here and dividing by that term. You can all do that, right? You re remember how to do that. And in the end, it looks like one minus i over a times i. Here in order to take get this out from the exponent into something we can actually work with, take the log of that. So the log of this fraction here equals this. And that's that's kind of nice because this is a function of these linear components. So once we have it in that form, it's exactly the same thing as the multiple linear regression. And we can apply multiple linear regression and isolate and analyze the individual factors. And I'm not going to go through that step by step by step right now. Now, if you, there, there's a, there are examples abundant on the web that you can easily find with uh, a set of data points that relate to cardiac risk factors and cholesterol levels and age and so on that are modeled in exactly the same way. And you can, there's R code for that if you Google for it. It's also, I think, explicitly spelled out in Dalgard's book, Introduction to Statistics with R. And that's a good homework to do. What I hope that, that you can take home, however, is some appreciation for why this works in the first place that the individual terms represent summations over these, these risk factors uh, that correspond to a logistic function and that um, the individual terms that can be modeled as a linear superposition of, of risk factors and solved within R. Okay. In summary, <clears throat> regression analysis is statistical techniques for modeling relationships. So whereas most of what we've heard about previous exploratory <coughs> data analysis, um, PCA analysis, um, clustering analysis, had to do with 
looking at relationships within the data in some way, describing the data with statistics. The, mark, the regression analysis and, and the related analysis don't just look at things within the data, they compare the data to some external model. So this is a statistical modeling. Um, we, the, modeling the relationship allows us parameter estimation to see what specific kind of models the data could be representing, hypothesis testing, whether this is you know, a linear model or not, and use of the model for prediction in it. Regression analysis say, what's the likelihood that somebody will get um, a heart attack if they're 70 years old and have been smoking all their life? Or um, it's a powerful framework that can be readily generalized, but in order to apply it well, you need to be familiar with the data. And I, can, I cannot overemphasize. Become competent to simulate, to try it with different variations, different assumptions generating synthetic data. Sometimes, you know, people call this toy data. I think this is completely the completely wrong approach. This is not toy data. This is the data that you use as your positive controls. This is the data that, you know, that reflects in your little computer model, which is easy to set up in R, your ideas, your knowledge of the data that you can then create and analyze and see whether your analytic routines will retrieve what you've put into them. And check that, play around with it, and check the model assumptions carefully. So where do you go from here? Again, I emphasize, do some more reading, try, try the examples out. Um, <clears throat> I think the examples that we've gone over this afternoon are easily generalizable, they can be easily templated to different to different applications. Um, if you play around with it, it's, it's going to be interesting. Um, if you don't actually get your hands on that, get your feet wet with it, and, and start playing around with it, you're going to forget it very quickly. Um, I, I always think what we can do in a workshop like that is not actually teach you a whole lot how to do things, but we can break down some of the activation barriers that inhibit you from ever trying out something in the first place. Now you've all at least copied and pasted that uh, code into your windows, so I hope the activation barriers have come down somewhere and you can start actually trying it yourself. But nothing uh, of copying and pasting will actually help you as much as closing that other window and trying to type it yourself. And you know, just trying to generate a few random deviates and, and generate statistics on them and so on and become familiar. I can't repeat this enough. Simulate your own data. Um, and especially if you look for simulations on logistic regression, um, you'll find that there's a couple of examples on, on the internet where you simply use um, the inbuilt probability functions to generate something that you then take out again. That's not really what I mean by simulating. When I speak about simulating, I mean simulating from first principles, by taking you know, observations, applying probabilities to the observations, looking at the outcomes, and then storing that as a data. Really running a computer experiment, and not just drawing from uh, a dis distribution for which you already know the properties. And most and most importantly, have fun with it. I think it's huge fun to, to you know, have this power over your data and start manipulating it and looking at it in, in different and several ways. And I hope that's something you can take home from this workshop, which we're very glad you attended and it was fun being here and teaching this. Now, before you all go away, I need to pass my stick onto Michelle. Nobody can leave until you do the survey. <laughs> so uh, there's a thanks for us for finishing today. Um, and thanks all of you sticking it out because I know it's a lot of information to take in and absorb.
but that's why we recorded it, so that I will probably in the next two weeks, because Raphael actually took his entire file of voice recording with him, so I don't have it. Uh, but within two weeks, I would check back on the bioinformatics.ca website for the voiced over lecture materials, so you can, again, take it and listen. So before you leave, the uh, couple things on the wiki. So the um, books that Morris brought, I've added those to the books section. Uh, the picture that we took yesterday is on the wiki. And Thank there you. is a link, if you scroll down a little bit, Morris, a link to the survey. So um, I know you surveys are hard. Yeah, why? Get another survey, fill it out, blah, blah, blah. But at the CBW, we actually take it very seriously. Um, <coughs> the, if you look at the course content from last year for statistics versus the course content this year, it's almost been completely revamped based on the feedback. So if we take the feedback very seriously and have an annual meeting to discuss what worked and what didn't work and what, what the student group needs um, for the work that they're doing in research. So take your time to fill it out. And uh, Francis is going to hand out certificates. For everybody who's still here, the tenacity certificate. <laughs> and for those of you who borrowed a computer, if you could just pack it up when you're finished and then check with me to make sure that you have told me that you've returned it and all components are. Yes? Where's It's a bit light yeah. on, on the topics, yeah. but it's a very, very good integrated introduction if you haven't mm -hmm. ever done any of them, mm -hmm. and the rest goes on. So I'm not doing books anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Just say no. <laughs> but, you know, there's, there's still a market in this. Oh, yeah. But in order to get something like that, the quality of downloads, this is so the one you the, the introduction to it. Oh, yeah. yeah. This is really good. Oh, yeah. And, uh, I guess you, I mean, you have to pick the niche market. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah like Pearl and Mayans.
I mentioned at the beginning, um, the uh, we've done advertising and promotion with workshop in a number of ways. In the end, the, the best way is you telling your friends and they telling their friends. And so, if you talk to some good workshop, but please do tell your friends and your colleagues, your lab mates, your mentors. Sorry, it's just the first. Brian. Brian. <laughs> <laughs> 